Hi, good evening. Thank you so much for joining us for our webinar tonight on endoscopic spine surgery. Um, I'm really excited to be able to talk to you about this topic. It's really a, a hot topic in the spine world and kind of taken over um, a, lot of, a lot of parts of the world. And now the U.S. is starting to catch on. So we're going to go over various parts. Um, so first, I want to go over our agenda tonight. We're going to cover um, a few topics. So first, Dr. Kim is going to talk to you about doing sort of just the decompressions, the laminectomies, the microdiscectomies, and um, how to get through that learning curve. Then I'm going to talk to you about endoscopic fusion, some pearls for success. And then finally, we're going to close out with Dr. Wu talking about um, the cervical spine techniques for endoscopic uh, surgery. And then we'll do a Q&A with all the faculty at the end. Um, so we are really excited. We really appreciate that you're taking the time out of your evening to um, learn about this. And um, with oh, and don't forget to use the um, QA, the Slido tool. I'll be moderating that, and if anything, any questions come up, we'll save them for the end, and then we'll go over them, all right? So first up, we have Dr. Kim. Um, he's going to talk to you about, um, you know, endoscopic decompressions, laminectomies, microdiscectomies, and the learning curve for sort of getting started with these techniques. So without further ado... Okay, good evening, everyone. Um, I'm sure that uh, everyone that have logged into the room have various degrees of experience with uh, endoscopic spine surgery. Uh, some of you probably just heard about it. Some of you might have done some cases. Probably none of you are masters at it, and if you are, you probably won't be wasting your time looking at this webinar. Um, so let's, I'm going to just assume that everyone's new, so forgive me if some of the uh, topics that I cover are too basic, but I'm also going to assume that most of you that have logged on have, are spine surgeons or have some familiarity with the uh, anatomy of the spine, okay? So I don't have to go over to uh, uh, basic uh, stuff. Okay, so evolution of minimally invasive, sp invasive spine surgery. So traditionally, the spine surgery was done via midline approach, right? Whether it's cervical, thoracic, or lumbar. Particularly if it's posterior approach, everything was done midline, cut the skin, get down to the bone, strip the muscle, and open everything. And then we realized, hey, we don't, maybe we don't have to do uh, all that opening and stripping. Maybe perhaps we could just open small areas of the spine and do the same thing. Then we also realize even opening a little bit can also damage the muscle, denervate the uh, muscle tissues. So then came the uh, tubular approach where rather than stripping the muscle off the lamina, perhaps we could stick a tube in there and dilate the muscle, thus lessening the uh, trauma to the uh, surrounding tissues. That, along with improved microscopic uh, techniques, really allowed us to do what we call a minimally invasive spine surgery. And that has become more of the go-to surgery for most of the spine surgeons uh, here in the United States. While, we're very con while we were being content with what we have, however, the rest of the world were not content, and they were looking into other techniques to really, really minimize the tissue damage. So that included the attempt at percutaneous discectomy, which you know, here in the United States, we have some degree of experience. Then also the endoscopic spine surgery. Again, I'm not saying that no one in the United States are doing endoscopic surgery, but unlike the rest of the world, it is not the mainstay of spinal surgery. And why is that? Well, as you know, endoscopic or arthroscopic surgery has been around for a long time. Those of you who are orthopedic trained, 
you know, a significant component of our training uh, years are spent on doing arthroscopy of the knee, elbow, shoulders, whatnot. If you have a joint, we'll scope. Same thing with the neurosurgery. I'm sure you guys done your share of scopes. Uh, there's a picture, you know, to your right where you're sticking a scope up someone's nostril and taking out a tumor in the, I think it's the brain. Yes, in the brain. And then, you know, obstetrics, GUIN, and general surgery also uses scope too. So what, the common theme is that uh, endoscopic surgery leaves smaller scar, less post-operative pain, better recovery, and obviously less chance of infection given the fact that you're operating on a closed environment and oftentimes with significant amounts of irrigation. So if you look at the adoption technolo technology adoption curve, and this can be applied to individuals of the society, and if you look at endoscopic surgery, we are us, the United States, State surgeons in the United States are really here. And, you know, if you try to look to see why, and you look at this, this is the World Endos Bipolar Endoscopic Spine Surgery Society meeting last year, right? And you look who's there, and you see mostly Asians and some Europeans. There was none present from the United States. So why are we so behind? And I looked into why. And it seems like, you know, everyone kind of is daunted by the, uh, the, the learning curve. And there's also the significant misconception by the established surgeons, surgeons who've been doing this for a long time. And they're like, oh, I could do everything through the tube. My incision's just as small as yours. And they also feel that the indication for the surgery is too limited, and I think that stems from old, you know, percutaneous discectomy misconception of indications and what it could do. And they also feel that the, the field of view that you get from endoscopic surgery is limited, which is not true. In fact, the view that you get from endoscopic surgery is much better than open surgery. And this is also, you know, that we were traumatized by the... Uh, Laser Spine Institute that went out of business, people, you know, uh, going down to wherever that was and coming back with Band-Aids, and yet the procedure itself was mostly a Band-Aid procedure. And more importantly, there's no financial incentive. You know, you learn this technique and you do this technique, and the RVU that you're going to get, the reimbursement that you're going to get is just as little as what you would get with endoscopic, I mean, uh, traditional open surgery, so why bother, right? And also, because it's endoscopic surgery, except for the unilateral, uniportal surgery, the bipodal surgery that I'm gonna talk about, there is no hardware that needs to be bought. So it's not driven by the industry. So there's no industry training the doctors to use our stuff, telling you know us to use their stuff. So a lack of industry uh, drive. And also, frankly speaking, there's really not that many opportunities for us to learn this and take, you know, courses in the lab. But this is changing. And there's been recently many opportunities, many uh, symposiums popping up all over the country uh, with anatomy labs and things like that uh, for us to uh, learn this technique. So some of the concerns I have discussed is the learning curve, right? It has a steep learning curve. And then for some of us who are very comfortable with traditional surgical techniques, they just don't want to take the dive, right? Um, and then the question, oh, what is the added benefit? Look at my incision. This is a inc picture of an incision with a tubular approach. And this is a picture of an incision with bipodal endoscopic spine surgery. And if you're really good at UB in, this is what you do. You're going to say, hey, look, put it, you know, same to me if you add up those two total incisions. Not true. So my past experience and observation with the percutaneous and endoscopic surgery has been uh, in the, I'm sure this procedure was around from the 80s and going into 90s, percutaneous discectomy procedure, introduction of percutaneous nucleotome, followed by some of the other techniques in the eight, uh, late 90s and early uh, 2000, including electrothermal 
uh, therapy, intradiscal uh, intra electrothermal therapy, and then came arthrocare with spine one, where we're percutaneous putting this rotating device, and uh, not rotating, electrical RF device that you go in and out, in and out, zapping, and uh, evaporating the nucleus material and sensing down the annulus. And then came the uh, Stryka decompressor, again, percutaneously, not open, not visualizing, inserting the disc, inserting this probe, which is a rotating uh, uh, auger, basically, and putting this in the center of the disc space and sucking at the nucleus with very variable success. Because you were taking a chance that you would, by chance, will fish out the fragment, but because you're not visualizing the herniated disc, oftentimes it led to incomplete decompression and poor outcome. So the, the true advancement was the uniportal endoscopic uh, spine surgery championed by uh, Tony Young uh, and his Wolf Yes system, which really truly was the first time someone could actually visualize what they were doing by having a portal that had a camera attached to it and then through the same portal, you can use uh, operative equipment to perform the surgery. So that was that, and then another uh, company came out with their own system, and this system allowed, system allowed us to do um, interlaminar approach rather than transfrimal approach. So this is a, uh, a, an example of a uniportal transfrimal approach where you go from outside the foramen as you can see here, and docking the uh, scope into the posterior lateral disc space and doing the discectomy. And this is the uh, first generation uh, optics. So the optics is terrible, right? It looks blue because oftentimes the surgeon would inject the disc with the uh, methylene blue so you could see the disc material. Uh, but the optics were limited. The field of view was really limited. So this really didn't really take off in the United States, whereas some of the rest of the world actually try to really take this to a different uh, level. Then came the uh, union uh, portal interlaminar approach with Joe Max, And this one would improve optics. You could see uh, this is the pre-op and post-op MRI. You could see that you know the, the anatomy much clearer you could see the dura being exposed by resecting the ligamentum flabum. And then by turning the scope around, you could work around the, uh, the canal and pull out the disc as you see on this uh, view here. But again, although you could visualize the area of pathology, the whole field of view is very limited. You know, that leads to frustration, uh, difficulties, a uh, uh, very steep learning curve. So although, you know, I went to Korea a couple of times to really try to learn this technique, I, every time I came back, it, it, it really, I, I could not jump, make that jump. Because I still haven't found what I was looking for. So just like how everyone in this world nowadays uh, gets their information, I went on Facebook. And this is what popped up on the Facebook, because I guess they knew what my interest was. Uh, so they kind of, I guess, AI popped this up on my feed. And it was this, bipolar approach to endoscopic spine surgery. So I said, sign me up. So I went to, uh, I signed up, went to California. You see this yellow here? This right here, that's me sitting there. And you can see how many people were there. Um, so this was a, really an eye-opening experience for me, uh, seeing the endoscopic spine surgery, but done in a very different way. So briefly, history of bipolar endoscopic surgery, you know, as much as the South Koreans want to say they're the Mecca, it did not originate in South Korea. It was actually uh, first developed by uh, a person from Bahrain, of all the uh, uh, places. So a couple of Korean guys visited the Professor Gaffar, and Professor Gaffa became the most uh, famous Bahrain in South Korea. And South Korean took this and really took it to a different level. So what is endoscopic bipolar, so unilateral bipolar endoscopic spine surgery? So you use 
two photos, right? Instead of using one photo, use two photos. One photo for the visualization, a second photo for doing the work. It's like doing the arthroscopy or the shoulder arthroscopy. That gives you greater flexibility, enhanced visualization, and increased versatility. And the equipment that we use is the stock equipment that we use for the knee scope to the shoulder scope. The way I compare unipodal endoscopic spine surgery to bipodal endoscopic spine surgery is riding unicycle versus bicycle. You can get to point A, from point A to point B, either on unicycle or bicycle, what would you rather choose? So the surgery that we do with bipolar endoscopic surgery is exact same as what you would do for microscopic discectomy or laminectomy or tubular discectomy or uh, decompression surgery. It's just that you know, we're using different tools rather than using the air uh, medium to uh, visualize. We're using the water as the medium to visualize things. But everything that you do with the tube, you can do with the endoscope. So it's easy to start. You don't have to go to the hospital administrator and ask them to buy you $150,000 tower because every hospital has arthroscopic towers, right? Every hospital has a scope. Every hospital has arthrex uh, equipment. So you don't need to buy anything. Only thing they need to is spend a few hundred thousand buying a zero degree scope. So how do we do this case? Anatomy is very important. The starting point is very important. Where your center of action is just like how you would start your tubular decompression. Distal end of the spinal lamina line. You want everything to end up there, right? So you make markings uh, under a fluoroscopy, and then you create, uh, I'll go through that by uh, step by step, but this is you know how you would set up a PN lateral, uh, and this line is where you want everything to converge onto. So you draw up a line. If you're doing a discectomy or just a, a decompression, you typically would make incision, a medial to the proximal pedicle, a medial to the distal pedicle, and you will advance the tool onto the spinal lamina line here. So although it's traditionally done with on fluoroscopy marking, what I have done in my institution is I have used navigation to do uh, mark the incision and also uh, to confirm the level. Uh, the advantage of intraoperative navigation is that those of you who are in training institutions, this is a great tool to uh, teach the rotating residents or the rotating fellows the anatomy, the topo topographic anatomy associated with endoscopic surgery uh, with just putting the pointer and correlating what you see with the uh, navigation system. So, and also, even though for a single level, it may take longer, if you're doing three levels, intraoperative navigation can also save time because you can just point and make the incision and point and make the incision rather than bringing your arm, wearing the lead, getting frustrated with AP and lateral and AP and lateral, right? So with intraoperative navigation, you're doing a three level. This is a scar for my three level full lamination. Uh, it actually saves time. So this is how the intraoperative navigation is used. Uh, it is the uh, fellow. Where you think is the spinal lamina line? Uh huh. And then show me the medial aspect of the capsule. Medial aspect of the capsule. And the inferior aspect of the facet. Inferior aspect of the facet. Excellent. Excellent. So you get instant feedback, uh, and I think that really accelerates their learning. And also, this can be taught to, so, you know, utilize to teach our colleagues as well. So, this is a, a quick video of how we if we start the case. We make two separate incisions, and then once we cut the skin and the fascia, we introduce blunt dilators, just like the tubular approach. Um, but you know, it's going up to only about four millimeters in diameter. And once the dilators are in place, uh, we 
strip the muscle, utilizing uh, like almost like a mini carb elevator, stripping the uh, muscle of the lamina. So this is what's happening. You're sticking the uh, mini carb elevator, you're scratching the muscle of the lamina and the spinous process and exposing this area for us to visualize. And the arthroscope is inserted and your tool is inserted. And this is a space that's created. And this is, even though the skin incision may be small, we cut the fascia a little bit bigger, which allows for better water flow, and that improves our visualization. So this is a little video of what you see when you initially insert the scope. You see the lamina, if we put the 90 degree RF1 and start to bring the tissue. You'll see a better uh, pictures uh, on the uh, subsequent slides. So I'm going to show a couple of uh, case examples. This is a 43-year-old male with left side L45 disc herniation. Um, this is high-speed diamond burr. We're creating a uh, small lamina. It's a little blurry here, but creating a laminotomy defect, just like we would do on a tubular or open micro case. We are resecting the lateral aspect of the lamina, and then this allowed us to uh, get to the ligamentum problem. We just uh, switching of the instruments, just like we would do with the knee scope. We're taking down the uh, tissue distally, taking down the ligamentum problem distally. You can see the dura underneath the keratin, right? You can see the dura here. And then once lateral recess is decompressed and visualized, the root is gently retracted, and the disc fragment underneath is extricated. And the, this is a post-op image. Um, this is a case of uh, someone with central disc herniation uh, with neurogenic claudication. Same thing. Uh, this one uh, has a little bit, oops, excuse me. A better uh, video. Again, the principle of the surgery is the same as open surgery. Take down the problem, you take down the overhang of the uh, lamina and the lateral recess. I okay, just went to the, uh, <laughs> sorry, I apologize. Okay, it, it is the same thing. So it is the next slide. So you can see the post op um, opening. I'm going to, this is a one quick study I'm going to show that. Compare the endoscopic dual portal surgery to the open technique and follow the patient for 12 months. And they all had similar outcomes, except for the fact that patients had significantly less pain immediately for the first week post-op. So what is the take home? You may say, oh, then is what's the uh, purpose? What's the use of endoscopic surgery? But at the end of the day, everyone did the same and everyone did very well. Well, you want to have a baby with or without epidural. That's my statement. Right? I mean, that first week of pain can be quite severe. Um, but anyways, um, so this is the, uh, some of the uh, scores of DAS and ODI that show that in the first immediate post-op period, significant reduction in pain in the endoscopic spine surgery with the pain scale mirroring each other and no complication in the endoscopic, one case of infection in microscopic case. Uh, this is one more case, and then I'll be finishing up. This is the case of a very severe stenosis, and you may say, wow, you could do a scope with that? Sure, why not? So, again, same approach. You do you drill out the lamina. You identify the midline, rapid, where the ligamentum problem detaches. And you go contralaterally. You drill out the contralateral lamina follow that down to the inferior articulating process. And you do the same on both sides, and then you identify and dissect out the ligamentum problem. And we use pituitary a lot in endoscopic spine surgery rather than the keratin, because you could really grab the whole darn thing by itself and pull them out as a one big piece. So at the end of the case, you will see 
axle anatomy, you'll see the contralateral uh, traversing nerve root. You'll see ipsilateral traverse, traversing nerve root you can see there. And at the end of the case, the, the degree of decompression that you will visualize is much, I dare to say, much better than tubular approach. So this is what we typically pull out when we do bilateral decompression. Big size ligamentum flabum, not even a piece of mill fashion of keratin, but with pituitary rangeur. And this is what the dura looks like at the end of the case. And this is will be a, this will be a po typical post-op MRI. And also, this technique is very helpful in morbidly obese patients, as you, I'm sure all of us have experienced with people that have subcutaneous fat that's thicker than the longest tube. Well, you don't need to have a longest tube. You just need to put a long sled down, and this would be great for a morbidly obese patient and avoiding big incisions and high rate of wound complications. So the concern, however, regarding endoscopic spine surgery is real. Uh, the learning curve is there, uh, but it's not that bad. Dual portal is not that bad. If I could do it, you could do it. And you just need to invest some time. Um, you need to visit some people that have done this, uh, have some good experience, and then, you know, do a couple of cases on cadaver, and, and you could really get started. Um, and I, I could tell you the, the visualization that you get and the, the degree of versatility that you realize with endoscopic surgery is tremendous once you get hang of it. Thank you. I went a little over time. That was an excellent talk. I don't think anyone minded um, the detail and care that you took to put together such a great talk. Um, again, I'm just going to remind you about questions in the Slido tool. Um, so if you have any questions, go ahead and send those to the tool and we'll take a look. Um, and then I'm going to talk to you about endoscopic fusions. So um, once you've done a few decompression cases, um, I think I did at least 20 or so uh, decompression microdisc and lamies before trying a um, fusion case. Um, it, that was a better part of like over the course of a year doing decompressions and then kind of slowly stepping into fusions. And once you start to get the hang of this endoscopic thing, you know, the, decom the fusion cases are pretty straightforward. So I'm gonna start out with a case. So I had a 76 year old um, female patient. I had previously done her ACDF, her two level ACDF. And um, a few years prior, she had undergone an L5S1 laminectomy and uninstrumented fusion. But she was starting to get severe left leg pain with like kind of burning into her left foot. Um, and it was just, she had an injection with one day release, but it was really debilitating. Um, and she had gone locally um, and gotten a recommendation from a pain management doctor who recommended the mild procedure. And so she came to see me. From my opinion, uh, she was happy with her HCDS outcome. She was neurointact. Um, so here are her x-rays. So we can see that she has this degenerative scoliosis, not sorry, an idiopathic scoliosis with degeneration on top of it. So you can see that she has some vertebral body rotation. So this is definitely an idiopathic scoliosis that she's had most of her life. And then on top of that, she has some arthritis, she has some cyst wedging. The apex of her curve is really around L3. So you can see there's some tightness on the left side at um, 3, 4, and 4, 5. And as well as there's like a slight subtle fondy at um, 4, 5 on the flexion extensive zone. This is her MRI. So I'm going to try and play this. Hopefully that will work. Um, so as we scroll through the axials, we can see that she doesn't really get into any issues until about Three four, um, and here at three four, she has the moderate stenosis, but not but not severe, and then severe central stenosis um, at four or five. Um, and when we get into the plane, you can see particularly on the left at um, four or five, and then five one is is okay with some right sided stuff. She has 
she had no right-sided symptoms. Um, and then the next slide goes over her sagittal images. Sorry, let me pause this. And and so she has um, some significant left foraminal stenosis. So really, it's kind of a bony stenosis. She doesn't have much um, space between the pedicle disc and then the next um, um, pedicle. It's really kind of wedged in there. And here is the CT. Uh, again, we can see her. Uh, you know, degeneration at multiple levels, um, a lot of arthritis. Um, on the scanner, she, her, her curve corrects um, pretty well, so she's flexible, but um, she still has a little bit of rotation and some curvature and, and lateral recess stenosis at 3-4, and then some severe central stenosis at 4-5 with that severe left foraminal stenosis. So overall, she has some central stenosis at 3-4, but really severe central stenosis at 4-5 with that left foraminal stenosis. So that's really her predominant symptoms. And then what are our options for that? Well, we can do uh, a 4-5 Lamy um, and some sort of inner body fusion. We could do an A-lift, we could do a lateral, we could do a T-lift, an open MIS or endoscopic. And given her significant um, scoliosis, I wanted to see if I could do this endoscopic and really take as, um, and really minimally approach this, as well as she had that on instrument diffusion at 5.1. Um, she has some uh, stenosis above. So seeing if we could, I could address this through an endoscopic technique. Additionally, she's 76, so I'd like to minimize her downtime. Um, so in endoscopic fusion, you know, the indications are the same as any fusion procedure. Basically, it's a posterior approach with a posterior inner body. So, any case you're going to do uh, MIS or open TILA, um, some sort of uh, minimally uh, dissecting flip, you know, you can do an endoscopic fusion for those cases. So, I'm going to go over the operative technique. Um, and so, what are the steps of the bipodal fusion? So first, you're going to establish your working portals. And when you're first starting out with doing endoscopic cases, this is a really crucial part because this really orients you, right? Because where you place your portals really determines what things are going to look like when you start out. Then as you get more used to what you're looking at, the portal placement doesn't become as critical. It's still very important, but it doesn't um, become as uh, you can kind of work with imperfect portals. The first step is going to be establishing your portals, and, and then after that, you're going to create your working space. So you're going to um, use your pituitary and your RF wand to make a working space. And then after that, you're going to do uh, your I your facet resection. So removing your IAP and then removing your SAP. Now, some surgeons prefer to do their laminectomy before doing the facetectomy. I prefer to do my laminectomy afterwards. I like to leave the flavum intact, go very lateral, so I can retract as minimally as possible. But everyone has their own reasons for doing everything, and so you could do your laminectomy before you start taking your facet joint down. After that, you want to do your annulotomy and discectomy, so you want to do your disc prep. So you can see here in image E, there's your disc face, and then it, um, image eye here, you can see a very nicely um, prepped disc space um, in your annulus is in front there, or your ALL is in front, and very, very clean disc space. Um, and then after this, you want to do your bone grafting uh, and cage insertion. And then after this, then for me, I prefer to do my laminectomy at this point. Once all the danger stuff of putting in your um, cage and doing your disc prep. Once it's all done, then I'll take the flavum down, which was protecting everything before, um, and get into the interlaminar space. And then if I need to do essential decompression and come across, then I can do all of that. And then you can do your posterior instrumentation after that, whether it's um, navigated, 
fluoro based or with the robot. Um, so portal placement, there are a lot of options for how you do your portal placement based off the goals of what you're trying to look at. So this is just an article looking at the different described placements of the portal. Um, and then you can see that you can have two portals, you can have three portals. You can have left, right, and then your camera portal. You can have your superior and inferior portal. You can put a medial portal. Um, so there's lots of different options for placing your portal. Um, my preference, uh, I'll go, go into my preference in a second, but really if you look at what are you trying to see and what are you trying to remove and your angle of your disc, that's really going to determine your portal placement. So you can see that there's, in this um, drawing, there's the modified posterior lateral portal and then there's the extra foraminal portal which makes a lot of sense. So if you, in uh, picture A here, if you need to do a central decompression, a laminectomy, then that's what you want your view to be, right? You want to be able to see across, you want to be able to get under the spinous process and across the contralateral side. But if you don't need to do a central decompression, then really your view can just be um, as shown in B. You really just need to get your IAP resected, your SAP, get into that um, transpyramidal space and, and do your disc prep from there. It's just important to remember the angle of entry into the disc based off of these um, sort of trajectories because it's a little bit different. With A, when you place your inner body, it's gonna be a little more straight down and then you have the angle in, right? Because you don't wanna retract your sequel back too much. Whereas B, that's gonna be more of a straight angle shot. Um, so these are just different things to think about. This is kind of what I think about when I'm looking at where I want to make my portals. But in general, I'm just lateral to the pedicle, um, aiming towards, you know, the, the top of the facet joint, lateral aspect of the part, kind of the isthmus area. Um, and for me, this tends to work out um, because it's kind of splitting the difference. I can see the facet joint. I can get in my... Um, inner body in at an angle, and then if I need to, then I can kind of look up with my camera and get across. It's a little more, it, it feels definitely more like I'm looking across than down if I'm doing a central decompression from this angle, as opposed to, as you heard Dr. Kim, when you're doing a micro disc or a laminectomy alone, that you're going to be medial to the pedicle. Um, so it definitely does feel like you're kind of looking up and over, but that works for getting your inner body in as well as getting access to the rest of the areas you need to decompress. So here's another graphic that I want to thank Dr. Wu for. Um, a picture, this is showing where you want to make your portals just lateral to your pedicles. Um, and you're kind of targeting the isthmus of the um, disc space. And then you're also targeting your disc, the angle of entry into your disc. And so you can see here on the AP and then on your uh, lateral image what you're really going for. And if you can kind of match this on your floral shots, then your portals are in a good spot, um, and which is really important. So you can navigate these, um, which I'm starting to do with um, the robot, uh, plan out screws based in this, in this trajectory. Um, measuring the thickness of the soft tissue up to the skin on the MRI, and then I just use a screw basically with this length and um, plan it as if it's going into this, this area with this trajectory, and then I can use a robot to make my portal incision. Um, and that's been fun to sort of play around with uh, navigating and then sort of um, using the robot to localize the portal placement. Then once you get place your portals, of course, you're going to develop your working space, which is just over, um, this is shown as just over the lamina. You might be a little bit um, distal to that as more the isthmus or um, just the start of the facet joint. Um, the lamina is always a great lighthouse. So if you feel that, you always know you're, where you are, um, and that can be really helpful. But it's just important to make sure that you are lateral enough that you can come down and around the facet joint so you can fully release that. And then here's a video of establishing the working space. Um, this can take a fair amount of time at first because you uh, want to make sure that you are um, 
uh, in the right, over the right level, you understand where your lamina is, where your facet joint, where your capsule is. Um, and then it can take a while to fully release the entire facet capsule. There's usually a couple areas of, well, uh, that are a little challenging to get. And it's usually the top and bottom of the facet. Those areas, you kind of have to come around to the caudal aspect to really release that bottom part and then the, and the cephalid aspect to really release the top part. And, but once you've released that, then you can come around laterally and then you've got your whole facet joint release. Here is just a video of some burring. Um, so you can either use a burr or an osteotome to resect your IAP. It's probably faster to use an osteotome. Um, I prefer to burr just so I can watch the development of the flavum underneath uh, to know I'm safe. Um, but you're just going to set your resection margin and burr through your line. And then once it's released, you can take out your IAP. You can take out a big chunk. Sometimes you have to kind of work it to get it through your portal incision, and then you have your autograph there. Um, and then you're going to do your disc prep. So the same way you would with any uh, T-lift, you want to clear out as much, uh, clear out all the discs. Um, and there are different uh, tools that are sort of specialized to the bipolar technique. Um, and you can use different curettes or... Oh, sorry. Um, and you can use different curette, end plate curettes, and you can really um, get a good feel. Now, some people, depending on the quality of the bone, you don't want to go too crazy on this part because um, you don't want to violate the end plate, right? But you can you can get a sense and you can really feel. Um, so you may want to, if it's softer bone, you may want to use just like curved curettes as opposed to any sort of rasp or end plate curettes. And then once you've cleared out your, um, your disc space, you can use a, a funnel to place, place some bone graft. Um, and then you can do your uh, uh, inner body placement. So here is my cage, and it's going into the disc space. And so for this particular cage, I like to bury it fully and then check on x-ray to see if I can advance it further. Um, so I want the whole um, in insertion piece to be into the disc space, and then on x-ray I can expand it. And then here just is a look at the um, device once it's in. And then once I have my inner body in, then I go back and I do my um, laminectomy and central decompression if need be. It just feels a little bit safer that way. Um, because the other videos, I wasn't retracting the, the fecal sac or the traversing nerve root, um, just being very lateral and leaving the flavum in place to protect it. Um, but this is after I've done the complete um, laminectomy for my central decompression. And so these, these are just some final looks, looking at where my inner body is and then my central decompression, um, nice and exposed uh, fecal sac and you can still, you know, issues with the inner body. And then the final x-rays. Um, so once the decompression is done, the, once the inner body is in, then the decompression, um, then I do a uh, robotic assisted screw placement. Um, I can plan out my screw placement in advance and then make adjustments based off of the portal. So um, in a lot of my fusion cases, I just have two little incisions on either side of the back. Not that I'm particularly um, concerned about the cosmesis. I just think it's kind of cool that I was able to do all of this on the x-ray through really tiny incisions. Um, and then she was doing well. Her leg pain was much better, and she wasn't taking any narcotics. This was at her uh, two-week appointment. And this is what I'm seeing with the endoscopic fusion um, pieces. They come back for their two-week close-up check, off narcotics, walking around, maybe taking some Tylenol or a muscle relaxer as needed. They're not fully recovered, but they are definitely much further along to where it's almost like they're six 
week or three month appointment compared to my tubular cases. Um, some of the patients for the endoscopic fusion at two weeks, I'm kind of thinking maybe they could start some BT, but no, I want them to cool down. But they are at that activity level, which is very different from a lot of the tubular fusion cases. Um, so just a little few notes about using navigation. Um, this is a nice article going through step-by-step -step using um, navigation to help in endoscopic fusion cases for both um, portal placement and then checking um, where you're burring and sort of all the different steps um, in your case. So um, checking your IAP resection. And I think navigation is great um, when you're first starting out and doing your first two pieces. Because I'm, I'm putting my screws in under robotic assistance, I have navigation right there. So um, I'm not saying that you should give it up, but it just really helps in the learning curve. And then you can keep using it, and you just don't have to refer to it as much. But it's always nice to be able to check where things are um, and just confirm. And then also, it, it's great for teaching. So it's just really easy to let residents and fellows kind of point things out, and then I know that they know where everything is, and they can um, proceed safely. Um, this is kind of just a picture of me using like all the technologies I can. Um, so I've got my camera, I've got a probe. Um, here on my um, screen, I can see where the probe is. And then on um, the camera screen, I can match that with where I'm looking so I know exactly where my camera's looking. Um, and then um, later, I can use the robotic assistance for my screw placement. So just a, a few cases on the uh, what the literature is showing, endoscopic T-lift versus MIS T-lift. And there's a theme for endoscopic cases in general, whether it's microdisc, lamies, or fusion. And that's the immediate post-op pain is significantly less. So this is a study um, in a prospective randomized pilot study showing that uh, the preoperative pain was the same in all patients. But one day in three months after surgery was significantly less than the endoscopic fusion. And really, isn't that the point? We want to get patients back to their lives sooner. So if we can do that with endoscopic cases, that uh, endoscopic techniques, that is wonderful. Another one comparing MIS versus bi-portal and single-level cases. And you can see the post-op pain at two weeks and two months is significantly better in the bi-portal cases. And, um, you know, as Dr. Kim said, do you want an epidural for childbirth? And I had an epidural twice. Like, why go through pain if you don't have to? Um, and I think all of our patients would agree that if they could have less pain in the immediate postoperative period, they would definitely sign up for that. Um, another one, again, this is a, a meta-analysis, which just took all the data from these studies and, again, said, yes, less pain in the uh, at at the immediate post-op period. Um, and this is just sort of a summary of that, of another study looking at um, the liter uh, of sort of all of the literature. And bipartal TLIF outperformed uh, MIS TLIF in pain and SF36 at one, two days, two weeks, one month, and two months after surgery. So let's let our patients have less pain and get back to their lives even sooner if we can. Thank you very much for your attention. And um, again, please send us questions. And up next, we have Dr. Wu going over cervical techniques. We are very excited to have him here. He's been with us for this year and quite an expert in everything endoscopic. Good evening, and thank you for everyone. Uh, my great honor to take a chance in here at NIU. Uh, my name is Zhong Yun Wu, and I'm a research volunteer in NYU Orthopedic Surgery. I'm a Korean neurosurgeon. So we start. Uh, there are many kind of cervical decompression procedures in microscopy there. Uh, for the first is laminectomy, we do our without fusion and laminoplasty. Foraminotomy and laminoforaminotomy. 
they are uh, among them. First philosophical parameter is first described by Cavill at 1946, and this is for universal cervical parameter synopsis or for essential discrimination, but it is not indicated in hypothesis at index level. Uh, some some researcher says multilevel PCF is safe and effective. Uh, it is also good to uh, multilevel. Uh, but nowadays the uh, end of topic era, you know, so many many researcher has published about uh, about transferring microscope uh, from microscope to endoscope, uh, even in unipolar or bipolar. There are many researchers which is which is presenting about the results of of endoscopic cervical surgery, cervical foraminotomy surgery. Uh, and also there are comparative studies with the unipotal versus bipolar and uh, even with, with microscopic surgery. All this literature says that endoscopic surgery is even uh, same or better results than microscopic surgery. Uh, nearly same results and some, some features of advantages compared with microscopic surgery. And there are uh, many extended application of applications of bipolar endoscopic surgery, such as uh, facetical removal and uh, contralateral foraminotomy, uh, standing on contralateral side. This is called uh, inclinatory foraminotomy. It, it has the advantage to more uh, all undercutting can able and more undercutting procedures. So let's start bipolar endoscopic uh, cervical foraminotomy. I I will call this as UBE PCF. There is uh, some advantages of UBE PCF. At first, first we have minimal injury on muscles and ligamental structures and less bleeding and that's a post-operative pain. It is important. When I was doing microscopic cervical foraminotomy, the patients always said, my arm pain, light aching pain is gone, but my neck is aching. Uh, they say this for a long time, but after I changed to endoscopic surgery, bipolar surgery, uh, this has gone. They said the immediate neck pain off. And uh, bipolar surgery can use, unlike unipolar surgery, can use same microsurgical instruments. As Dr. Kim said, no more cost. And there is continuous cell line navigation, and it, it provides clear view and lesser chance of infection and lesser bleeding. Uh, and unlike lumbar, lumbar bipolar surgery, in cervical bipolar surgery, we can make two, two level surgery in one pair of for us, because the cervical structures is smaller than lumbar structures, and the space between level is very narrow, so we can approach two two levels in one pair for us. There are indications indications for cervical foraminotomy is uh, cervical foraminal stenosis and cervical foraminal discoordination. Contraindication is that below a uh, central discoordination cannot be done. Make, uh, cannot be done with these procedures, and if there is instability or RLA or infectious condition, it, it is not able. But uh, bilateral, for the bilateral reason, it is arguable there is some debate. Theoretically, posterosophical paraminotomy is for unilateral reason only, but some surgeons doing bi bilateral reasons altogether and they said it is good and it is safe and there is no instability. So further study is mandatory. And for cervical myelopathy and cervical central canal stenosis, when we encounter this sensitivity, it cannot be treated with the cervical foraminotomy. But uh, as, as I will say in, in the latter part of this presentation, with the cervical ULBD technique, it can be overcome. Let's make a portal. Let's start with the surgery, UV PCF. Uh, at first, we must make portal for us. Uh, in the later view, two pores are made superior to the pedicle, each pedicle, and in the, in the AP view, two pores are created at medial border of the pedicle. And then, 
uh, we have to find the B point as a starting point. Before this, uh, as in the lumbar surgery, we have to stretch out and detach the muscles and soft tissues around the lamina and facet joints and uh, at the B, B point. So, uh, medial dilator and the T-shaped T -shaped scratcher is applied, but uh, during the detachment procedures, it is important. Surgical lamina is thinner and weaker than lumbar one. So during uh, making the stretch, during the stretching, you can you can break the cervical lamina and uh, penetrate the spinal cord. It can be catastrophic. And even though the interlaminar space is very narrow, you can penetrate through the interlaminar space. So I don't use a T-shaped scratcher in cervical surgery. After the scratching and detachment, intro introducing scope and uh, instrument, there are many soft tissues over the bones. So, astrocare ones is applied to ablate and co coagulate the soft tissues. Let's, let's find the three points. Even uh, pituitary process and Peristipensis are using use the to remove the soft tissues. There is three points on there over there. Regulate ablate again, and after finding finding out the starting point of three points, start to drill. And next, when we are doing uh, decompression, theoretically, posterior cervical coronotomy is keyhole surgery. So we must make a round hole. But for the beginners, novice, for, for the novice, it is recommended to make a, a pear-shaped so lamin, lamino foraminotomy. This makes no instability, no, uh, no difference between keyhole in making instability. So uh, make, making pear-shaped lamino foraminotomy is recommended, I suggest. Why the, why the laminotomy on, on, on the lamina? And ligament of platinum is removed. Then you can see spinal cord, cord and the dura over there. After removal, remove the ligament of platinum, you can see the central portion, and then go right there. Like the piecemeal, step by step. Go right there and go right there. And you can find the starting point of the root. With the sharp hook, you can feel upper and lower pedicle and the passage through foramen. And you can remove this point. In this case, so the cervical foramen of the female, uh, 57 years old, patients with Posterior neck pain and left arm radiating pain. A severe pain, she complained of severe pain, so unable to check MRI. So, patching a demaro injection was done for checking of MRI. On MRI view, this is oblique view to facilitate viewing the foramen. C5, 6, and 6, 7, six, seven level, there was protruded, protruded disc and Especially on, on C5-6 level, ruptured disc was seen. This foramen view, and both level has foramen stay on this. C5-6 axial, left side. 5 6 left side. So two level decompression and disectomy was planned. Two portal was made. This is for C5-6 level. And then same portal was used, and this is for the blue one is for C67 level. This is operation video. After, after removal of the soft tissue, start from the V point, wheel out, and removal of the, of the platform, then go later. later then you can see loop here uh, when you are approached to this space sometimes 
partial pediculous semi is required to uh, is facilitated to approach to, to the disk space. This fragment is this and removed. After one level is completed, tachocon shielding and covering of this with the, the material to prevent the plasma collection. Uh, during the forever surgery, you can just slide to another level. Then same procedures one were done on here. C six seven level was just foraminal stenosis. The foraminal the foraminal decompression surgery was then because there is a free loop. Uh, the end point is uh, when to end. It is important when to end the foraminal decompression. I use the uh, cap hook and uh, insert the hook around the root and find out the redundancy of root. If that is very tight, make more foraminal to me. But if it has much free space, I stop uh, the, the operation. This is post operative flame of C5, 6 level, and 6, 7 level. The next case is 76, 76 years old female patient with, with left side foraminal HMTC 6, 7. Uh, this is the disc protrusion and in low, uh, especially low signal intensity. In CT view, there are some calcified end plate, end plate to bony spur was was present. So this is the operation. <laughs> Making from out the middle, looking for around the bony point. Compression was done. After seeing the root, there was some space on axilla, so I approached through this, and this space was thin. Some pre, pre fragments was removed with the post situated process, but there are still remains and the plate bony spur. So in case of this, you can use the uh, osteotome, hammer, osteotome and hammering like this. You can use, uh, with the use of osteotome, you can remove the ventral region pathology, ventral area pathology. After that, you can see the removed, the high, low signal intensity materials on the entire area. Next case is, is 82 years old male patient with posterior neck pain and right time radiating pain. Uh, pain dermatome is especially combined on C8 dermatome. So X-ray and MRI was checked. The X-ray showed the flight kyphosis and the severe degenerative changes. MRI showed multi-level stenosis and bilateral foraminal stenosis, but there are special ones. On C7, T1 level, light side passage is high signal intensity vessellism was checked. On foraminal view, bilateral foraminal stenosis was checked on multi-level. So, I concentrated on this, this pathology. Operation plan was laminoforamine from C7, T1, light and passages to removal by UV technique. Why? There were many stenotic reasons in other levels, but I managed T7, C7, T1 only because his, his, his symptom was developed in extreme severe form and he showed no sign of myopathy, just this radical effect. And dermatome was only C8. So, the photo uh, was photo ma making was done, and 
such a one start it the passage joint was severely degenerated the habit to uh to the have to know the anatomical the anatomical has to know the anatomy clearly so after removal of some lamina and ligament problem i can see the dura central portion of the spinal cord there was some epidural path and remove, after removal of that i can see the good axilla portion on the axilla portion this is hematoma liquefied hematoma in, in the passage joint uh, in the passage this was maybe the uh, Passages with acute hemorrhagic change, it causes the severe pain. After decompression, the capsule of passages was completely removed. Then this is the post of view, and pathesis was clearly removed, and a bus was dramatically decreased. After three months, there was no instability. When we are doing foraminotomy, uh, we should take uh, be, uh, be careful of the, the identify the motor root. It is divided with uh, from the sensory root, so. If there are some reasons, it can be misdiagnosed as herniated disc problem. So be careful. And next step is cervical ULVD. Uh, unilateral portion bilateral compression for cervical myelopathy by UV technique. Is it able? Yes, it is able. Uh, there are many steps on UV, ULVD technique, and also uh, there are introduced introducing literature. Uh, it is important that during the cervical surgery, many many surgeons are concerned about the water pressure effect on the spinal cord. But there are many there are some equations calculating the water pressure water pressure, but this is not directly applicated on UV surgery, but I don't know. <laughs> So I don't know, but the important important point is uh, automated irrigation pump should should be less than 30 millimeter Hg, and the most most important thing is output flow. If output flow is blocked by check valve, like check valve, uh, the accumulated water in the working space can make make the pressure to the uh, spinal cord. So Facilitate output output flow is more important than anything. And uh, during the ULVD of cervical entry point is somewhat different from the posterior foramen foramenotum. Uh, I made on the lateral board of pedicle to facilitate contralateral decompression. Like this, as you see. Red line is for the foraminotomy, and blue line is for the ULBD. During the cervical surgery, sometimes abrupt bleeding by artery artery is developed. In in case of this, using small tip as care devices and insert it through the bleeding focal point and Fill the door, fill the root door spinal cord. When touches on the cord or root, push it some several points. When you are pushing the bleeding root, it, the bleeding can be decreased. Then, then you can ablate it. Then you can coagulate it and manage bleeding. Keep, keep stability during the surgery is important. And unlike the microscopic surgery, uh, endoscopic surgery can prevent 
less, um, can make less of parable tibial musculature injury, and especially on interspinous ligament and supraspinous tooth ligament preservation. Uh, it has the advantage over the microscopic surgery. Best case is, is about the ULBD. 86 years old male patient complaining quadriparesis and severe bosom pain, allogenic, allogenia natures, developed after the fall down injury and direct head trauma. He has both shoulder evidection weakness and uh, both hand aggressive weakness, both leg weakness. On X ray and MRI showed slight central recesses of C3 4 and near fusion, spontaneous fusion of C4 5 disc level and severe degeneration on the low level. MRI showed this on C3 4 and C4 5 there was minimal stenosis, central stenosis. Especially, there is severe stenosis on C5 6 level and bilateral polymer stenosis. On C5-6. So I focused on C5-6 and first HDDF was done, done to uh, height reduction on this level and release the foraminal stenosis. HDDF was done and position was changed to prone and then posterior decompression was made. Unlike the foraminal stenosis, laminectomy is started from the lamina, not at the, not at the free point. Upper and lower lamina was drilled out. Sorry for poor quality of the videos. Central decompression was done and ligamentum problem was removed. After that, you can see the central spinal cord. And then contralateral drilling was made. And later edge of the uh, later recess was removed. Later recess bone was linked with the punches and also ligament problem was linked. After that, you can feel the lateral border of the contralateral dura, contralateral spinal cord. After the surgery, uh, pain was covered. Pain was still, uh, dramatically decreased, and motor, motor function was recovered in progressively. There was myelopathic signal change on MRI, and complete decompression was made. Thank you for listening. All right. Well, thank you, Dr. Wu, for that excellent talk on um, cervical uh, endoscopic techniques. Okay. I'm going to try and move here a little bit. Okay. So now we have a little time for questions. So one of the questions um, that was brought up was on the economic. I'm just going to go through the bottom of the list. Um, was on the economics of um, MIS versus open versus endoscopic decompression. So, Dr. Kim, do you, do you want to feel that one? Sure. I think, you know, every new technology that come, you know, comes with cost, right? The technologies always cost more money than old technology, it seems like, whether it's surgery or medicine. Um, but at the end of the day, it improves the, uh, our ability to treat different pathologies with less pain and uh, better recovery, uh, improved recovery rate, and then I think it's worth it. I mean, the arguments were made for robotic surgeries in other surgical fields. Same arguments were made for arthroscopic surgery and orthopedic surgery. And I think we can make the same argument for the spine surgery. And we can somehow, if we can somehow prove that the long-term outcome of this endoscopic surgery compared to conventional open surgery is better. To me, that will be a bonus in terms of uh, decrease rate of infection, 
uh, decreased rate of recurrence of symptoms and things like that. Great. Um, okay, another question, uh, just in general, anyone can take it. Um, how many bags of fluid do these cases take and what is the out portal? So outflow, because we talked a little, you know, we talked a little bit about the importance of outflow. So which portal is outflow and how much water do we use? Well, typically the working portal is the outflow, right? So you have the uh, arthros the endoscope in one photo, and that tends to be small the incision. At least I make a small incision. Dr. Poto, Dr. Wu loves to switch his arms left and right, so I think your incision is the same, yeah. right? Um, but I try to make my uh, endoscope photo a little bit more watertight, so I get more of a unidirectional water flow out to the working photo. So when you stick your surgical instrument in there, uh, the water is constantly flowing out through that hole. And there's a little device, that we call it a sled. Uh, it looks like a one-third tube of plate. Then you stick it in there, and then it kind of keeps the area open. Yeah. Um, it, it, some people call it the, the flowing geyser sign. If you have good outflow, it's really sort of bubbling and um, coming out, and you have constant water coming out of there. Um, another question was, how long do the fusion case cases take? So some of my fusion cases are straightforward, one level TLF and that's all I'm doing. Other cases are with central decompression. Other cases are with an additional upper or lower level lam um, laminotomy decompression. Um, so if it's just a straightforward fusion, and maybe at this point I'm still pretty slow, maybe like four or five hours. Um, but I, you know, once I've gotten this working, this workflow with portal placement and navigation and everything, um, yeah, I do expect to be, um, decreasing time. But Dr. Wu, how long does your, how long was like a single level fusion take you? Because he's been doing this for years. Um, when, when I was first surprised, it took two and a half hours, but <laughs> the time was longer. Yeah. So three hours. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, our next question is, what is the rate of dual tear, and how do you fix it? Um, I think I have the most extensive experience. <laughs> <laughs> so I gotta tell you. So I think, you know, with everything else, during a learning curve phase, you do get into some issues, including dual tear. Um, but once you get good at it, I could really, really tell you your rate of dural tear is almost none. It is so much safer than tubular decompression because you, you could literally drive your endoscope all the way to the contralateral side. You could see the takeoff of the root contralaterally. You're not like squinting your eyes and stretching out your arms as you decompress in the contralateral side. It is safer. The degree of magnification that you have with endoscope is amazing. Sometimes you could drive the scope right to the uh, capillary vessel, and you could, and I kid you not, you could literally see the each red blood cells pulsate <laughs> through the capillary, and I'm not lying. And the other thing about endoscope surgery is that most of the dural tears are managed by just putting a little uh, Dr. Wu. Uh, referenced it before, it's called Taco Seal. It's basically a biomaterial that you would just slap it onto the dura and it kind of sticks to the dura. And you just kind of close the wound and just get them up and moving. It just kind of seals itself. It's almost like, you know, somebody getting a dural puncture, right? And we don't really do much about it. Sometimes they complain of a headache, but you rest them for a couple of days and they get better. So almost, mo would you, Three of the uh, dual tear that I had in the beginning, which was very few, were managed with almost like a benign neglect and ignoring the fact that I had it. I just mobilized the patient and they actually are okay. Yes, 
a, Na- a NASA clip. They're, MR- they're MRI compatible um, little clips that you can. Um, and that's what I've seen from people when they're doing um, intradural tumors. We'll, we'll close with that and then talk with Seal over it. Um, I, now I am trying the suture technique on my first. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God bless you. Um, okay, and then we had a question on um, uh, graft materials. So what are we using in the fusion cases? Um, most of the time I'm able to get a chunk of the IAP and then a smaller piece of the SAP. So I will run that through the bone mill and put that into this space along with some Kinsella's chips. Um, before that, I put in some BMP into the, into the disk space, and then a little bit of um, bone graft, the autograph and allograph, and then the inner body. What about you guys? Same? It's so easy. The same as MIS clip. So you can use whatever you use in MIS clip. Yeah, if you're going to use BMP, though, you just kind of have to make sure you don't float that out. You <laughs> grab it with the pituitary and you you know, put it in there with a nice contralateral corner and make sure you don't flush that out. But I have used the MP sponge. Yeah. Um, and then our last question, can you read that? I guess what is your preference for interbody type for this procedure? Yeah. Um, I've been using an expandable T list, so either um, sort of uh, a cephalad caudal expansion or um, uh, cephalad caudal and medial lateral. Um, so I've been using like the single plane expandable or the dual plane expandable. Uh, is that what you guys use? Yes, the uh, couple of kids I had that I use the expandable cage as well. Um, I know some surgeons in different parts of the world they <laughs> use really up they up, uh, utilize what they call far far lateral approach, and they actually use thoracic lateral cage in the lumbar interbody fusion. So they get a huge footprint. Um, have you? No, I don't have it. I usually use banana, banana shaped Okay. Just in case you couldn't hear Dr. Wu, he's a banana shaped cage. All right, great. Um, okay, well that's it for our questions and we're at 825, so we're like right on time. Um, again, thank you so much for joining us. We are so excited to present. Um, if you have any questions or concerns, you can reach out to me, uh, charla.fisher at nyulangone.org. Um, again, that's charla.fisher at nyulangone.org. If you have any questions about any of this, I'm happy to reach out to these guys as well on your behalf. Um, so thank you again for joining us, and we hope you have a lovely evening. <laughs>